Hey, welcome back to my channel. My name is Rachel, that is the R in the RK Stumbly Bear, and I am a reader and a writer. And today I am doing my week 26 wrap up. Now this video is going to be a little bit different than normal, just to set expectations. I am going to do my book wrap up and then I'm going to be do my June stats. I'm then going to do my dessertathon wrap up, which was the low key readathon that I was doing in the month of June. I think I mentioned it at the beginning and then really didn't mention it again, but I did complete prompts for it, so I'll go over what prompts I finished. I then am going to give you a Jane Austen July TBR because I'm low key doing that in July, and then we'll do my writing wrap up and other media. And if there's anything that you're not interested, feel free to skip because it will be chaptered down below. So it'll be easy to see where to go for the item that you're actually interested in. Jumping in with my book wrap up. This week I finished The All-Consuming World by Cassandra Kopp. One, this was my sci-fi buzzword prompt for this month. And it was something that's been on my TBR since it was published. It came out, I think, in September of 2021. So still within a new release year span for me. So I will do a full review for this in a different video. Essentially, this is a book about the band getting back together and the band members don't want to get back together. This features a lot of toxic relationships and the fallout of how things went down last time. It follows a group that had been known as the Dirty Dozen. It was an all-female mercenary group and then following the death of some members at their last job, they split. And now Rita, the head of the group, is wanting to get the band back together and basically try their last job again. And for each person, she sells it a little bit differently. We follow three perspectives. We follow Maya, Pimento, and Elise in this, but we mostly follow Maya. She's like kind of like the pro protagonist. Pimento is an AI, but every other character in this book is a clone. So it is established early that Rita is a psychopath. And in Maya's programming, or Maya has had a code programmed into her clone where she is very loyal to Rita. And everyone knows this, and they still blame her for it. And still call her like Rita's faithful dog. But Maya is noticing how Rita is not exactly telling anyone the truth behind her motivations as she is trying to get the band back together. She's telling them the things she thinks will motivate them to join back. And Maya's having an internal emotional struggle of who should she really be loyal to? I mean, she's programmed to be loyal to Rita, but is Rita really the one who has her best interests at heart? If you like toxic relationships, that is this band of people. <laughs> It is one toxic relationship after another. There are good relationships portrayed in the book, healthy relationships, but for the Dirty Dozen, that group as a whole was a toxic relationship. Something that I think Cassandra Kyle did really well was having characters who were all one time thought to be female. Two of the characters came out as not female and the way they did it, you know, was very natural in a conversation. And then you get to actually see how they're being accepted and people are really working hard to remember, like one character has changed their name, so they're working hard to remember this is the new name for this character and this is the correct pronouns. And we, you, you get to see them being corrected. And it was nice to get to see that in this book as well, is that is a natural progression of things your view of someone has changed, they've asked you asked you to change it, and you're doing everything you can too. But even when you slip, you have friends who will correct you and not be like, oh my gosh, you're a horrible person. How, why aren't you remembering this? They're like, no, this is the, the correct name. No, this is the correct pronoun. So I thought that was done really, really well, just to show that progression of how people will change with those who have updated their identity. That was something that was really well done in this book. And it was a nice balance 
against the toxic relationships. Again, I will have a full review coming up for this later in the month of July. I really enjoyed this and if you like space and toxic relationships, I think you will as well. And then I kind of just picked up and started reading a little bit of things. Last week I read the first chapter and so I read half of the second chapter in this. Planning, my, my goal was to pick this up more once the all-consuming world had been finished, but I got a little distracted by August Kitko and the Mechas from Space. And I hold up my phone because it's an E arc that I got. It's coming out later in July and I am loving this book. It starts off with a jazz pianist who was originally hired to play at a victory party. And it was supposed to be a victory against these vanguard mechas that were coming to destroy the world, destroy Earth. And then the ship that had gone out to destroy him failed. And so now it's an end of the world party. The mecha that they knew that was coming to destroy him, they had named Juliet. Juliet arrives. And then another vanguard called Grey Malkin arrives and they start fighting. Nobody knows what's going on. But Gus, the main character, he feels like how they're communicating is very musical tones. And so he finds a piano and starts playing. And ends up, Grey Malkin likes his playing and takes him. And that's the first chapter. So I was hooked. And it's only like snowballed from there. This is a dual perspective book we're following August Kitko, who goes by Gus, and then the other viewpoint is Arden Violet, who is a rock pop star. And the two of them had a fling right before the end of the world party, and then didn't go well after that. And so now they're trying a relationship out to see, could we like each other? Maybe? We know we have physical chemistry, and it's an interesting subplot and missed vanguards and Earth's doom kind of plotline. And I'm really, really digging it. So I also started Hurricane Summer by Asha Bromfield. This was published last year and I've had it on my interested to read list. This is about a young woman as she goes to visit her father in Jamaica for the summer. And it, from the forward, I get the themes are gonna be womanhood. Know, as a teenager turns into a woman and coming into the their own strength and coming into themselves sort of a story. I read the first chapter so far and I, I am interested. And then I was in a reread mood so I picked up Valor's Choice by Tanya Huff and this follows Torin Kerr, Staff Sergeant Torin Kerr. She's from a combat unit and a general comes along and says, guess what? You need to put a platoon together and then play honor guard to our ambassadors as we try to get this other planet to join our confederation. And she's not happy about it. The soldiers with her are not happy about it because their, because their leave was canceled in order to do this. They had just gotten back from being in a combat situation. And like I said, this is a reread, so I already know that I like it. And then... I barely started Persuasion by Jane Austen, which I will talk more about when I do my Jane Austen July TBR. Going on for the my stats for June. So for the month of June, I finished six stories, four novels and two novellas. For my 2022 new releases goal, I finished two. The Kaiju Preservation Society, which came out in March, and then Perils of Sea and Sky by Lillian Horn, which will be published in September. For my Goodreads currently reading goal, I started at 160 and I ended at 160 because I did not read anything from my currently reading list. For my physical TBR, I started at 71 and then I have picked up a lot of books. So I need to actually recount and find out what that is. So the new number will be listed on the graphic. And then for my Finish Already series, I did not finish any of the series I have already started, but the two series I did start are caught up because book two is not out for either one of them. So I still have 90 to finish and I have 20 that are caught up now. And that wraps up my stats. So moving into my Desertathon wrap up for June, I was low-key participating in this 
readathon. I think I talked about it at the very beginning of the month and then didn't mention it again. But just to wrap up, all six of the items I read this month do qualify. Now, I was on the Celestial Cupcakes team and our recipe was the chocolate cupcake and I did not complete all of the prompts for that. But just going through the prompts that I did complete and which book qualifies for which. For our recipe, I completed Flower, which was for favorite genre, and that was The All-Consuming World by Cassandra Ka. Then I completed Milk, which was a white cover, and that is the Kaiji Preservation Society. I completed Eggs, that is part of a series, and for that, Perils of Sea and Sky, because that is the first in a series. Vanilla, a book I keep saying I'll read, and I figured since I took two months to read it, The Unbroken by C.L. Clark works for this one. For other ingredients, not for the recipe that my team had, I completed Brown Sugar, which was a book that I had low or no expectations for, and that was Sea Daughter, Sun Daughter by Amy Ogden. I just knew it was a novella that had been nominated for the Nebulas, and that was what made me interested. And then I completed Philo Doe, Very Thin, which is a novella or a short story, and for that one, The Necessity of Stars by E. Catherine Tobler qualifies for that. So all six of my books did very nicely work for a prompt, and that was cool. And so for the month of July, I decided that I would also low-key participate in another readathon, and that readathon that I've chosen is Jane Austen July. There are actually seven prompts from the original videos, but six, prompts six and seven have to do with watching a TV show or movie, so they're media-based. I'm just gonna go over the book prompts. So the, for the first five, the first one is one, read one of Jane Austen's main works, and for that I chose Persuasion by Jane Austen. I have read Emma and Pride and Prejudice, and so I figured I would do this one. And this one will make sense here in a moment of why I chose Persuasion, because I do have all of them on my shelf. Or prop number two is read one of Jane Austen's other works, novellas, juvenilia, etc. And for that, I have chosen to do Lady Susan, which is also the buddy read that is happening later this month. So I figured, why not have it? Let's go ahead and just do it all together. The novel buddy read that they're doing is Pride and Prejudice, which I have read many times, and I wanted to read one of the her novels that I hadn't read before. For prop number three, it is read a work of nonfiction related to Jane Austen or the Regency era. And for this, I chose Jane at Home by Lucy War Worsley. And what I understand, it's going to be talking about the actual homes that she lived in and how they related to her. And that is something that interests me because your home and its setup really reflects you. My office 100% reflects me and my personality. Then four is read a retelling of a Jane Austen story or a historical fiction set in the Regency era. And for that one, I, ch I chose Where the Rhythm Takes You, which is a persuasion story. And so I figured if I am doing, well, if I'm going to be reading a persuasion retelling, I should actually read persuasion first. And then number five, read a work by a contemporary of Jane Austen. So this is someone who was publishing at the same time, and I have chosen to do Waverly by Walter Scott. It was already on my to want my want to read list, and I figured it's a good time to pick it up. So that's what I'm planning to read for the Jane Austen July. Obviously, I'll be reading more science fiction and other books as well. And again, I'm low-key participating in this, so if all I end up reading is Persuasion or Lady Susan, I'm happy. For my writing wrap-up, it has been a good week. I have been writing pretty steadily, at least 15 minutes every day, which is great. To the point where yesterday, which was the 1st of July, I sat down to write without even thinking about it, and then realized later in the day it was the first day of Camp July, Camp Nano July. And my goal for Camp Nano is to write 500 words a day. So I did not write 500 words yesterday, but I still wrote, so that's still a win. <laughs> And I don't have any particular thing that I'm working on. Uh, well, I guess what I'm working on is I'm doing the writing excuses prompts currently for those videos that I'm series that I'm working on. But I don't have any main story that I am otherwise working on. I'm just writing and I'm happy about it. 
and for other media. See, this is actually the second time I'm filming this because the first time it didn't save. I know I'm not going to be able to repeat what I said before, but there was one podcast in particular that kind of stuck out to me. Generally, I, re I generally I listen to a lot of writing podcasts or space podcasts, like I'd like the NASA podcast podcasts, but I also have a couple traveling podcasts. And for the one that I was specifically listening to was the, it's called Zero to Travel. And the idea is to get people out there and traveling. The host is one of the founders of a group called Location Indie, where it's, you know, encouraging people if you want to not be tied down to one location or a set, a set expectation of hours, they encourage you to try to find something that works for the lifestyle that you want to live. And this particular interview was talking with somebody who wanted to be location independent. They wanted to be able to travel and work from anywhere in the world on their time schedule, which is something that I do want eventually in my life. I want to be able to work from home when I want to, or, oh, hey, I'm going to go travel to see my sister in Japan. I want to be able to, you know, still work sometimes. Like if she's doing her work days, I can do my work and I'm not trapped to certain hours. So to me, that lifestyle is very appealing. But something else that they were talking about was taking risks and how making a big shift in your life can seem like a very risky thing to do. And it made me start thinking about how as we get older, if we aren't pushing ourselves even a little bit outside of our comfort zone, we begin to get fearful. And it's when people begin to get fearful that begin, we begin to want to close our borders. We start labeling people as other. We take on more racist personas. We want to start controlling people and what they do with their bodies and their time and their money. And that all just comes out of fear and living a fearful life. So it's important for us to take risks, even if you only do like a mini adventure in your own town. It, it's still important to step outside your comfort zone. And that's not exactly what this interview is about, but that's how my mind kept going and it fed off of it. So yeah, I, you know, I'm thinking of the ways, how have I gotten more fearful in my life? And what can I do to step outside of my comfort zone and to live a full life, live, a, live the life that I want to live? You know, everything that we consume, read, watch, media, whatever, it all affects us. So that has been my week. How has yours been? I hope it's been well and that you and yours have been safe and healthy. Thank you and have a great day.